I think we we'll just just turn the hour. So what we'll 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 get things started and uh, do a few introductions. So again, thank you very much for everybody joining us today, and uh, welcome to this the latest in the Pure IP Coffee Club Live series. Today we're going to be looking at Copilot, which has been a very very um, uh, exciting uh, topic and it certainly stimulated a lot of interest throughout people, hence uh, the number of people on the call today, which is fantastic. Um, and I thought I'd lost you for a minute there, gentlemen. Um, so we're going to be looking at how we, what is Copilot and the leveraging of it and etc. But before we get, to get into the, the weeds of it and the details, um, I'm joined by two experts in the field, um, and uh, if you both gents would like to introduce yourself, perhaps Tom, if you'd like to start uh, first, and then we'll go on to Chris. Yeah, sure. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining. Uh, Tom Vathnot, so uh, long-time Microsoft MVP and uh, Solutions Director at Pure IP as well. Hi, guys. Um, I'm Chris Wheeler. I'm a technical specialist at Microsoft in the Modern Work team. Um, focusing around um, productivity and also co-pilot for Microsoft 365. So yeah, really happy to be here to uh, to, to support. And very excited about co-pilot, I think, aren't you? I bet. Yeah, <laughs> always. You're not, you're not supporting, Chris. You're leading. That's the that's what we what we yeah. read, right? That's what we said. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much, Jensen. I appreciate you spending the time to to help share the knowledge and the wisdom that you have and the experiences. So. Um, Without further ado, we'll start to kick off. And I think, Chris, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw the first first question to yourself. And I think let's let's level set a little bit in terms of, you know, giving giving the audience a little bit of an understanding of what Copilot is, the, the sort of the variance of it, and, and how it works. Yeah, of course. So, um, as you are very much aware, you know, we we've been doing a lot of work in the field of AI since before, you know, open AI in general. So we're very much trying to be a a pioneer and be revolutionary in, in that regard. So where, where Copilot came from, we we effectively worked with the team over at OpenAI to start working on some generative AI tools that we can bake into the solutions that we already provide and sell to our customers. Um, we came up with the, the, the term Copilot simply because it's kind of like that, um, that that assistant that's there by your side, but never really takes over control. So it's always there as like a, um, like, like that virtual assistant to help us generate content, summarize content, um, explore content, and even in some cases as well, educate ourselves as well. Mm -hmm. um, so what we've done previously as well is that we we first looked at offering Copilot in all the individual solutions. So you'll see a Copilot in pretty much every Microsoft technology, whether that's Dynamics, Azure, Security, Microsoft 365, of course. Um, and then moving forwards, what we wanted to do as well is to have like a consistent experience between all of them and have a lot of um, uh, a little bit of overlap, as, as it were. So you'd have like a single co-pilot interface and that would then integrate into all of your various different licenses like M365 Dynamics. So that's kind of where we came up with the idea of just calling it co-pilot is like the overarching product. And then mm -hmm. we then got all the individual products which you see and you, you hear about already. So there's things like Copilot in Windows, there's Copilot in Bing, there's there's loads of different things that we're doing. Copilot and Power Platform, the, the, the list goes on. And it also follows like our, our mission statement as well about empowering everyone in every organization to do more. And by having all the great Microsoft tools that we already have, it sort of goes along the fact that it doesn't really matter where you are in the world, what device you're using, what Microsoft application you've, you're you utilizing, there's going to be a co-pilot there to help you every step of the way. Um, so that's a little bit of an instruction where we are with Copilot. Now, how it works is um, everything really starts with a prompt. Copilot's never going to be automated. It's never going to be there taking over. It always has to be um, triggered by a request from a, from a user. So everything starts off with a prompt or a request into Copilot. And depending on the service that it patches um, that it latches on or, or um, retrieves content from, be that you know your Microsoft 365 data, maybe say like in security, it'll be like you know your um, telemetry from your data logs or little bits and pieces like that. So it's then able to then work within the solutions that we've trained the models on 
and be able to produce some really good outcomes. We do that by basically taking that content and then we have got things like our large language models, which then we've pre-built and we've trained up with the with the OpenAI team to basically be able to understand our intent and be able to respond in a way that um, aligns with our, our, um, our requests. So for example, if I'm in Word, for example, I ask it to create a, um, a risk assessment about something and then all of that then gets done sent off to the LLM and then comes back in a timely manner as well so there's some really good things happening in the background which then helps to basically reduce the time it takes to perform these actions um, the, the best thing I like about it is to re, um, basically in, um, reduce the um, the effort it takes to do things as well. So there's a lot of talk about, you know, the mental energy it takes to perform certain tasks and certainly the more mundane tasks as well. And in some cases as well, we increase the quality of our out, output as well. Um, so like in terms of like, say, you know, catching up on a missed meeting, the actual quality of um, maybe possibly talking about what was missed during the meetings or possibly even like the outcome of our emails, our documents, there's some really good things happening there as well. But yeah, everything starts with a prompt. So it always has to be triggered by the by the user that's that's using Copilot. Brilliant. That's, that's, that's brilliant. What I find fascinating is that uh, the, the, the subject or the topic of AI has been around for, for years, uh, but actually now it's, it's it seems as if it's being applied in a way that really helps the business um, and, and, and helps the individual to do more and be be more efficient actually, as you rightly say so I think it's it's a fascinating topic which is probably why we've got so much interest in it uh, going around and I think that, that you, you alluded to a, a, a few little scenarios there Chris and perhaps Tom I can bring you in on the, this and again, what sort of scenarios and use cases in that are you seeing this this sort of co-pilot being suited to yeah, it's, it's a great question. And as Chris said, it's kind of a it's a family of products. So um, it's both a product and a family of products because God bless Microsoft marketing naming, right? Um, <laughs> but kind of what was called Bing Chat is now the base copilot. So the kind of web based chat experience. So that's where you know consumers can get to it. You don't need a license. You can do your kind of basic, you know, kind of asking questions and, and creating content. And then you step up into the different types of copilot. Um, so there's then copilot with commercial data protection, which is basically the same thing. Keep me honest, Chris, but you know, kind of has the commercial data protection wrap, so enterprises can use it a bit more securely. Where we really step into some really exciting functionality in the kind of knowledge worker and therefore teams and teams phone space is when you're a Microsoft Copilot for Microsoft 365. So the the Copilot where it's integrating or the Copilot capabilities of integrating into Teams, into Excel, into Outlook, it's the whole suite. Um, specifically, obviously for me, super focused on Teams. I think it's one of the stronger use cases for AI because you can summarize chats, you can summarize meetings, you can ask, you know, kind of for summaries as the meeting's running. And, and all those same capabilities you so often see demoed in meetings are also available in Teams phone. And I, I think a lot of people miss that is that, that yes, meetings is a really obvious and really strong use case. But once you start using Copilot, you kind of get used to using it. You want it on all your comms, and that's where Teams phone, being able to press that button and have it run during a classic phone call is really powerful as well. Yeah, and I think it, it just takes from, from the participants, it, it, it means you're focusing more on the call rather than on taking the notes and trying to remember something. And certainly, I know I suffer from that uh, from time to time. And, and Chris, I mean, is the, can you elaborate any more? Is there other use cases you're seeing um that um are yeah to any of that yeah i mean like you know like touching on what tom said it, it you know it, it's largely around you know what you're already using your microsoft 365 applications for so you know if you feel a need to you know use um more um you know have more assistance in your meetings or your phone calls because you know the topics of conversation could be quite um varied or complex then you know, AI assistants can obviously look at the transcript and help you there. But, you know, we see lots of other job functions. So like, you know, say finance, heavy Excel hitters, you know, real, you know, large formulas and big tables where, you know, Copilot can dissect that and produce really great data insights, suggest new formulas in there as well that we've seen. Um, 
you know, analyze spreadsheets as such, um, or say like, you know, you're, you're in marketing, you do a lot of things in PowerPoint, there's loads of things around, you know, creativity boost with using Copilot and especially tapping into designer where we're doing a lot of things there with Dali and creating AI, you know, images there as well. So some really good things happening. Um, but yeah, it really depends on the job role, what you're mainly focused on, you know, some really good use cases with, you know, the creative um, piece, the, the creation of content. Um, we're also seeing a lot of um, time save, those real heavy hitters in m365 as well so mm. you know the real key personas that are in back-to-back -back meetings all the time they maybe say create four documents a day you know there's massive burnout there's productivity paranoia that we still see since the days of covid so you know we want to try and save them a lot of time as well where maybe they are working overtime or they're you know they're burnt out and we give them time back where they could either spend it you know doing what they need to do in their personal life, spend it with family and be more happy, or actually in their job roles, focusing more around innovation and the things that really excite them um, as well. So that that's some sort of really good use cases there as well. So looking at the tools, but then what the impact is of of having that time saved. Yeah, yeah, how you, how you apply it is critical in all of these cases, isn't it, with any new technology? But th there is an interesting question actually that I, I see, Tom, you've seen on the, the, the chat that's come through, and it might be worth us just covering that now. Um, and that that is very much um, around. Um, it, does Copilot pose any threat to the adoption of Microsoft Teams rooms, um, or, or or can the two happily exist? Yeah, it's a great question because obviously when you think about Copilot, you're thinking about using it on your desktop, on your laptop, in your personal meeting. It's your personal assistant. Um, but actually, with Microsoft Teams rooms those rooms have the technology to understand um, if you voice enroll who's saying what in a meeting and you can also uh, optionally again enroll your um, face profile as well so yes. the meeting is then picking up all the people in the meeting room what they individually said which feeds the transcript which means that the co-pilot summaries will actually be better so for the best experience in co-pilot you actually need the microsoft teams room to do that knowing who said what otherwise you end up with a transcript that says meeting room said meeting room said which doesn't work so well in co-pilot um yeah. so so yeah it's a it's, it's a really valid question but actually I think Copilot will spur people on to get meeting rooms out with this technology. And obviously, we're at the beginning of the journey, so you can imagine that story across MTR and Teams is going to get stronger and stronger around AI. Yeah. Is there anything you wanted to add to that, Chris? I saw you. No, I no, hundred percent, hundred percent agree to what Tom said. Yeah, in terms of like where we see. You know, shared resources are always going to be slightly difficult in terms of, you know, that personal co-pilot touch. So what I'm asking co-pilot for, but like Tom said, you know, breaking out the transcription to different people. And mm. like you said, trying to get some clarity over what was said, action points, um, you know, that that side of things works really well. So, um, yeah, f fully agree with all of it. Fabulous. So, I mean, that moves us on. I mean, we, we've been sort of talk waxing lyrical for the last sort of 10, 12 minutes in terms of the the benefits um, of, uh, of Copilot and what it can do for the user, the productivity, the efficiency, the workflow, et cetera, et cetera. But what are some of the things as a, as a corporate business owner or an IT director or a CIO, what are some of the things that the business might need to consider when they're sort of evaluating Copilot? And I mean, I guess some of the obvious things are sort of security and governance and those sort of things, but what, what, what else is there that we need to think about? Yeah, um, so I think to go back to basics, there needs to be a common um, goal or, you know, a, a need that needs to be identified. And that's going to come from various different departments and, you know, pain points that maybe might be there or maybe you're trying to introduce a new a new process that's going to streamline, um, you know, your, your processes in your, you know, in your operations. Um, Obviously, the considerations with the Microsoft 365 is, of course, it's going to be looking at your M365 data. You know, it will be um, given the opportunity to potentially surface information that the user has got access to, which they might not have known about before. So things like public SharePoint sites and, um, you know, you'll see this term that gets um, used a lot by Microsoft around the indexing. And there's like two levels of indexing where I'll be able to work with you on all the documents that you've already accessed before and you know all your chats and emails because that's yours but obviously the real value of copilot as well is the exploration piece where if i ask a certain question about a project or a customer or 
something, then it's going to look at those public sites as well and find the information which might be beneficial for me based on what I've asked for around the actual intent, around the, the, the semantics. So like, for example, if I ask about electric vehicles, it might say, right, Tom's worked very closely with electric vehicles. We're going to have a look at things Tom's been working on. Or maybe like there's another um, prompt or there's another piece of the prompt that we're going to add that's going to include the words BMW, Honda, Hyundai and all that good stuff as well. So there's obviously a risk, of course, around oversharing of information, looking at how we are storing our files as an organization. Um, there's things around unprotected documents as well. So if you have sensitive content, is it encrypted? Is it labeled correctly? Um, there's a lot of sort of housekeeping that we we recommend our customers to look at and consider to begin with before possibly looking at Copilot. Um, but having said that, we've also got customers that accept the risk that if users already have access to these files, then there's nothing stopping them from doing it manually. It's just the code part is going to do it a bit quicker and obviously in a, in a yeah. shorter time frame. So customers, some, some customers that we've worked with just accept that risk that even if the content is then retrieved by Copilot and sent to our LLM, they understand that it's protected. We don't use the, the data to train our models. Everything comes back very quickly. And because it's all in memory in our LLM, it's all volatile. It gets overwritten and deleted straight away, all ready for the next prompt to come in. So there is always going to be an element of risk, but the risk is kind of already there. Um, yeah. Now, on the other side, we've seen other sort of technologies before where, you know, like Microsoft Delve, for example, um, and that was uh, an interesting product because that just used to surface content without us asking for it and just saying, oh, hey, look what Tom's been working on recently. But where Copilot is a little bit of a one step further, it has to work off a prompt or a question. So the user has to request that. <laughs> um, but there are safeguards in place around that as well. So say like if I ask about a certain project, which is very sensitive, or I might ask Copilot to tell me, you know, uh, is there an Excel spreadsheet with a list of all of our customers? You're able to report on that as well. So whilst there may be, you know, the opportunity for malicious intent or, you know, some things which we shouldn't be asking about, then that can also be reported and audited um, as well. So there's obviously a fair usage with with Copilot in to say, look, this is designed to help you be productive, you know, um, save time. But if you're trying to use it to either break or really test the um, the vulnerabilities in, in your environment, you can still report on it. But obviously that's down to, you know, that's a trust element as well with employees. That's down to, look, you know, you follow your company handbook, you, you know, you handle data appropriately, you follow the, the, the book really well. But obviously having a really good tool like Copilot, which can help you with that, um, that's always like a consideration just to say, look, you know, we need to bake into our policies like around the fair use of AI. Um, mm -hmm. at, at Microsoft, we're very... Um, one of the important things around our responsible AI principles is all about accountability. So where Microsoft are accountable for some things with AI, obviously we built the system, our customers are always responsible for their own data as well. So that's very, very important um, uh, factor to consider. Um, but there's also, yeah, going back to, I mean, you know, we, we, Ian, you touch on the, um, the, the, the governance and the, and the compliance really well, but yeah, generally just like, you know, look at your personas, understand where, um, you know, there is a real need to have Copilot. Obviously, Copilot might not be for everyone, depends on what it is that they're doing. They might not be working in Word, Excel, PowerPoint, but they, they might be working in Teams. So you can find those real niche use cases. And as well as that, the other consideration as well that we're finding very important is also the extensibility of Copilot. So as Microsoft, we understand, I'm going to say three things. Well, let's, let's trim it down to two. The first one is that we understand that not, not all data lives in Microsoft 365. So how do we tap into that? So we've got some really cool um, use cases coming out where we can extend Microsoft Graph to incorporate other data sources. So whether you've got like SQL databases, you might have on-premise SharePoint sites, other third-party applications where you can basically connect that and bring that into the Copilot ecosystem. Um, and then the other side of things as well, talking about applications, is that as Microsoft, we understand that not every Microsoft application offers everything that a customer um, is is looking for. Which you know, no way, Chris. There, there are other applications out there. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and you know, and like we've seen with Teams, you know, we've got thousands of plugins and applications from various SaaS providers that do the job really well, and we can bring that into our M365 environment. And we're doing the same thing with Copilot as well. 
It's, it's still early days. I mean, I think at the moment there's about 24, 25 um, vendors at the moment that have made their plugins. So you'll see things like Trello, ServiceNow, Jira um, from Atlassian. So, you know, it's still early days there. But also consider the other things where, you know, what other resources can we tap into that we can make it a really good Copile experience? And you can you can build on top of that yourselves internally. To, I mean, this skews to using a partner or a big organization, but they can build with Copilot Studio line of business for your internal use cases. And that can be really powerful because you're then tapping into something somebody already does and saving them time and effort as well. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, it's interesting. So you, you see a day when sort of you'll have a call and your actions will go straight to your Trello board. Yeah, if you ask the if you ask the prompt to say what say like Jira or Service Now, you're on a phone call and you can say what tickets have I got opened up for this person based on our conversation, and it'll patch straight into your third party plugin and be able to say right yeah. based on your conversation, this is relating to this ticket. Um, so it just works really well. Or like say like it's patched into your CRM or your ERP systems. This is relating to this opportunity. You know, if you want to update the the CRM. Uh, notes or anything you can do so straight through through copilot so um at the moment though you know as as copilot's still really new um on a phone call it just looks at the transcript and you can really only lean on the uh the the pre-trained model around the the conversation um and obviously around the transcript as a source of information but moving forward we have seen when you're in a meeting or on a phone call you can then tap in and use those plugins to do things like, you know, a Bing web search or a, a Jira, um, a prompt using Jira or, you know, Copilot for sales, which we'll use Dynamics or Salesforce. So, yeah, we are sort of bringing that extensibility in. We're still early days, but um, yeah, that will further enhance that experience. So if you're on a phone call at the moment, transcripts are great for, like, say, after a phone call, because you can then do your wrap up. You can say, you can use Copilot and say, can you write an email based on what we talked about? Great. Can I send it off, copy and paste it, put it into Outlook? That'll probably be a little bit more streamlined. But also actually using Copilot during the phone call as well, where you can mm -hmm. patch into those applications. Um, yeah, I think things like um, Sales Copilot as well, where your your phone calls are probably more customer is an interesting use case. And yeah, as, as Chris said rightly, we're kind of on a journey here, but like you can definitely see that CRM integration being like absolute gold dust to anybody that does either either service like the contact center. I say contact center in inverted commas because there's a various different scenarios in that subset or sales being able to have you know summaries and notes and as you say and potentially in the future suggested actions is, is going to be mm. amazing a really um a really interesting topic though actually whilst we're talking about it is obviously there is a there is a uh, an obvious risk to to phone calls as well because ultimately you're having a one-to-one -one call with someone and obviously that requires a lot of attention and the way that we use copilot is also in a conversational manner so effectively, you're 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 having, especially if you're using it during a phone call, there is a risk that you're having two conversations. So the risk, of course, is how much attention can I give the person that I'm speaking to compared to if I'm interacting with co-pilots. So those there's, there's sort of like um like an accountability piece in there as well to say actually, you know, in meetings is a little bit different because you can slip away a little bit, and you know if you're not talking and you know say like you're ten minutes late to a meeting, you could just use co-pilot to catch up. You can't really do that in a phone call mm. so yeah. there are going to be some really interesting use cases coming out for teams phone i think where it might be that you know generally speaking like say you know in a contact center you will have to tap into those resources um albeit you know when you do things naturally in a crm system you're on a platform and you're going you know you're clicking to the source of information and you can do that whilst talking with someone but then if you're talking yeah. to someone and then typing in a prompt it's going to be quite challenging and obviously i think there's going to be a risk to accessibility here as well especially with like the neuro the neurodiverse where i can only focus on one thing and i don't want to show someone that i'm not paying attention to them so there's going to be some real sort yeah. of key considerations and usage when we when we start using phone a lot more i find on phone i tend to do it mostly post call so i'll always hit the button because i'd rather pay attention than make notes and then i'm kind of safe in the knowledge that yeah. i've got the notes and you know what happens with calls as well you you, you sometimes they think they're going to go nowhere and then you get deep suddenly and like oh 
now mm. I need to remember what the start of the conversation yeah. was because this uh, yeah. is more important. <laughs> Obviously, I treat every phone call with equal importance, but you know, sometimes you're like, oh wait, okay, now I need to remember what we said for the last twenty yeah. minutes. So yeah. just yeah. that that knowing that the transcript is there and that I can get the summary. And as you said, Chris, the kind of like the ability to interrogate the call after and go, what is the summary and ping that round. The other one I see um, with customers is being able to share that with somebody else. So you're the person who takes the first call, but you actually it's for somebody else or it's a better use case for somebody else. You've got that, you know, let's be honest, historically that's a pretty crappy handover, right? It's like mm. Sarah called, she wants to buy the thing. It's like, well, great. Now I have to start yeah. from scratch and poor Sarah is like, I explained this all to your colleague and now I'm doing it all again versus the co-pilot summary will be like, you know, much more detail about what yeah. the scenario was. That that deep um that deep conversation actually is quite interesting because another real use case I find is that if it gets like really complex or like you know if you couldn't remember the very beginning of the conversation that that during call use of copilot could also be used to say what questions can I ask this person right now because it might be that you're 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 stumbling to find things to ask or say based on possibly the the nature of the call itself mm. so we, we've also seen copilot to say look you know I you know you're talking about say I don't know, say like a subject I don't really, you know, um, I, I'm a bit kind of a novice on, say like, you know, we're talking about SQL databases. You guys are talking about, you know, passing information, merging tables together, and I haven't got a clue what you're talking about. Um, and I can just say like, Copilot, what what questions can I ask Tom right now? And then I can, and then Copilot will say, right, based on the transcript, you can ask Tom about SQL Server reporting services or analytical services. And then if I ask you that question, you go, that's a really good question, Chris. How you know you're you're really you know you're really attentive and like you know you know what we're talking about. You don't really want to say why well, I use Copilot, but you know it's there to help you during those conversations as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's like that fair, there's that 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 balance of you know if you over rely on it too much, you tend to kind of lose the human factor, and yeah. you know that, that's obviously going to lead into another conversation, of course. But um, yeah, in so, terms so on on that topic, actually, David Long in the chat asked, um, if you're running Copilot on your yeah. calls, is that something you need to announce like recording? And it's a great question because we haven't really, as a industry slash society, settled on that yet. Is like, oh. you know, there's very clear regulation around this call is recorded for regulatory and training purposes. And everybody says that all the time these days, almost yeah. to the point where everybody yeah. ignores it. Are, yeah. are we going to append AI to, say, to that? You may use AI in this conversation. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen anything from the IPO just yet. I know that you know this. No. Not, it's not an actual requirement to say that you're using AI, but actually, if I want to know how my data is being handled or what we're talking about is handled um, effectively, you know, firstly, you want to make sure it's not like a consumer model where things could get intercepted, but also. You know, in terms of like processing, that is a form of process because we are sending it off to be, you know, analyzed and and you know um, and and responded to by by an AI system. It's there to help us. But yeah, I I feel like there there should be something where, like you said, like this call may be used for training and monitoring purposes, and also may be used for AI. You know, it's it, just a couple yeah. of seconds afterwards. But it's it's, it's kind of challenging because it's what what do you define as AI? Because like we I saw this on a I was working with a customer who was doing a, a RFP and it was like explain how you use AI as part of their questions. And I was like, well, I mean, if they use spell check, they use AI. If they use you know like <laughs> yeah. like 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 what yeah. like the, all our codecs now have AI elements to them in the in the meeting. So like everything i mean there's no way that microsoft aren't using ai in their operations of their massive you know 400 million user service so like it's interesting to see where we draw the line or if we just end up yeah. accepting that the reality is uh, you know you don't say i'm using the the internet like everything's on the internet that's a given it's i wonder if ai will be the same thing it'll be like yes there's ai everywhere like yeah. chris said how you use the data is probably more important like are you securing it appropriately is it a proper trusted model yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure the regulatory side will catch up with us at some point in the future. But I, I can't have a feeling at the moment it's more of an etiquette question mm. um, in terms of you know, do you need to be informing people? But it's it's, it's a fascinating topic, um, and I, I think comes fits nicely into that sort of what do people need to consider. So, and it's this journey. We're still on this journey, and I think yeah. harping back to a, a couple of minutes ago, and we were talking about some of the applications and, and how it's coming through. There's another great question come through in terms of AI and auto attendance. I think Tom, you you mentioned in there about how the CC CC contact center vendors 
um, already building this into some of the scenarios. Um, uh, do you, can you elaborate any more on? Yeah, I mean, AI is going to have a massive impact on, you know, customer contact, customer contact center, how, whatever you want to call that kind of segment of, of the industry. So you're seeing a lot of the team certified contact centers because they're built, you know, on Azure or at least Azure adjacent using cognitive services, bringing in some of that technology. And initially it's, it's more scenarios like, um, you know, post call summaries and pushing data into CRM. Um, they're all being quite tentative about putting AI directly in front of the customer, um, not because just the technology, but also you as an organization are then liable for what the AI gives or says. So you have to be very careful about training and data. Um, so I think we'll start to see it as um, coaching the agent and providing information and mm -hmm. summaries. But I have zero doubt, like at some point, it's going to be an option on auto attendance to be like, wait for an agent or press one to interact with our AI. And, and even if it can cover the fundamental questions, you know, where's my order? What's the, like, authenticate me? What are the opening hours? Um, I've got this issue. Like, I, I'm, I'm really excited for that because it's going to be potentially a better experience for the user and a more cost-effective solution for the customer. So it's one of those rare cases in technology where you can both save money and improve the experience. Yeah. And yeah, we've all been stuck in some of those IVR systems. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I, don't hear anybody, I don't hear anybody saying that contact center experience is amazing and there's nothing that could be better. <laughs> like you, you can argue about how good or bad, but there's, there's room for improvement there. I think everybody agrees. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, I mean, I, I think, okay, so we, we, we've, we've talked a lot about the, the, the applications and the use cases, which I think has been, been brilliant. So what, what sort of, how does the licensing work? What does a customer need to get going on, on this co-pilot journey? Yeah. Um, Chris, you want to go? Yeah, I can do. Um, so largely, you know, Copilot is always designed to be, you know, user centric. So there's always going to be a, a like a user licensing model that that does deviate a little bit, depending on if you're on the fence around buying Copilot or building your own Copilot. So as with anything within, you know, OpenAI and especially around Azure, there are some consumption models that you can look at as well. So that's based on things like, you know, your messages and your prompts being sent or the transactions that occur. Um, more or less, the co-pilots that we're building into our applications, um, some of the features you'll see are already included. So if you already use Copilot and Bing, that's a free consumer service. Um, you know, Copilot and Windows, that's obviously if you've got Windows 11 at a certain version. So there are some things that are already baked in. So um, that, that's not too bad. So um, where you've got the commercial data protection, that, that qualifies if you've got an M365, a, a qualifying Microsoft 365 license. But where you've got things like, you know, Copilot for sales, Copilot for Microsoft 365, it's usually based around a per user model where you pay a certain amount for the license. Um, at the moment, you know, Microsoft 365 was one of the latest ones to come out. Obviously, before we had a bit of a threshold around 300, we've dropped that. Um, yeah, that, that, uh, don't gloss over that, Chris, because that's quite big, big news, and not, not everybody's yeah. caught up with that. Is now you yeah. can buy from one seat and up. So for yeah. for people on this call who are thinking of going on the journey, this was previously a. 100k plus kind of yes or no um yeah. now it's a 360 pound yes or no on a per That's, user basis yeah it's another good topic as well tom because at the moment even though like we have got um the licensing models on csp for example which of course usually is a monthly model or even if you buy direct that's that was monthly as well um co-pilot for microsoft 365 at the moment you have to pay up front for the year so you mentioned that 300 X fat sort of cost as well. So yeah. that, that's also something to consider is that if you're planning on trialing, just be mindful that if you buy one license, it will be for a whole year. So if you know if that if that aligns to your, you know you're going to be using it and testing it for a year and you can already see the value, that's great. But yeah, definitely around the removal of the 300 threshold, it's certainly now um allowed a lot of um different tenancies and different uh, companies and organizations to start a little bit smaller as well because typically with a Microsoft trial you would have 2550 that follow things like you know your team's rooms your team's phone you know start off with a manageable amount of users where you can yeah. collect feedback you can start you know start trying to break it if you, if you want to or you can then start to test the security compliance 
build in a good operational model if you run you know if you if you apply to things like ITIL processes then that's great but yeah that that lower threshold has certainly helped because we we, we grab the feedback from a load of organizations 300 as a starting point is great but in terms of a pilot it's really difficult to manage sometimes as well yeah. so and then of course you've got your smaller SM, SMCs where you know they might only have 500 people and you're then like trying to roll out 60 percent 70 percent of their their, their organization so yeah, certainly that threshold has been a real um, that that threshold being lowered has certainly been a real benefit. Yeah, I think I mean if you're any kind of size of organisation, I think I would, as Chris said, there's kind of uh, there's two security considerations. One is like, do you trust Microsoft? Well, like if you're on Microsoft 365, I feel like that ship sailed. You do trust them because you've given them all your email, all your documents. You know, so that's normally not an issue in organisations that are Microsoft 365. Then there's is our data totally aligned and permissioned correctly but if you're able to cap the risk at we're going to do a 10 person pilot inside of trusted bas in it you're limiting that risk as well but you're getting on the bandwagon i feel like at a cto level or a board level you can't really be and happy to be challenged on this you can't really be the organization that's ignoring ai it's too important to everybody to the industry to not have a, t a stance on it you might not you might not be for you it might not go down that road but you want to know what the capabilities are and chris said where are the challenges where are the drawbacks it's not it's early it's not a perfect product like there's a journey here so you, you can't really understand it without getting a little bit hands-on in your organization i don't think mm. no, no i agree i think it's and, and you you mentioned uh uh you'd mentioned something i've forgotten what you mentioned now i was just to pick up pick up on a point but um it'll come check back to the me. check check the co-pilot transcript check the co-pilot <laughs> transcript yeah I'll come, I'll come back to you when it's I've a real got good that. use case yeah <laughs> yeah real good use case for sort of old guys that can't remember what's just been said <laughs> um, yeah no but i mean i, I think that you, you're alluding there to um some of the sort of profiles and uses and the use case in terms of where it fits and benefits organizations and do you see that the the, the, the benefit to is pretty much agnostic to whether you're a large organization or a small organization i mean it, it feels to me as if it's one of those technologies which um, can have benefits across multiple size of organizations multiple sectors it, whereas so many other sort of applications and technologies a specific you, you can see oh there's more benefit for those there and those sort of users mm -hmm. i know there's a type of user might be different so frontline worker might be different to knowledge worker but in terms of the size of organization do you feel that that that's it's a kind of uniform benefit yeah i believe so yeah so you know regardless of size because you know at the end of the day it's it's the number i appreciate there's there's obviously other benefits to that around you know things like revenue and um reputation stature but obviously where you know where you're looking at the real sort of um not the foundations but the people that are basically running um or driving that that business forward or organization forward you know they're they're the people that need well i mean overall from a people perspective they need taken care of they need looking after and this kind of comes back to where we were trying to you know uh, look at solutions like employee experience where you know their happiness their retention and their you know their their dedication to the cause is um is is paramount so if we can give them an ai tool that can help them with that then you know you'll see other sort of benefits as well like staff retention you know mental well-being there, there was some really interesting stats around sick days um for there was something in um one, one of my colleagues in in local authorities was looking at social care and there was an in, interesting and alarming rate of the amount of people that were going off sick because of stress-related um illnesses and um where copilot can help them with that they saw um certainly one of the early access customers saw a decrease in the number of people that were reporting as being unwell um there were other things around um certainly the wrap-up times for contact center agents as well so there was an increase in quality in the in the wrap-up times there was an increase in quality in the actual responses to those customers as well around like tom said about simple questions around things that you can easily match up against a certain faq and say copilot can you match these two together and answer the question for me not a problem at all so yeah some real use benefits there and it, i think when i mentioned it at the very start there's there's there should be uh, 
a copilot for for absolutely everyone it's not going to be you know you're going to use copilot in every single application because that's never going to happen but yeah certainly around the use cases there'll be an element of your day-to-day life where you know tom mentioned before we're already using ai you know whether we're like yeah. you know talking to siri on our iphone or you know we're we're, we're, we're going clothes shopping online um like you mentioned about you know checking our grammar or um, you know, plotting our our our, um, our destination. You know, AI is already here, so you know it's it's just to say that there's going to be an AI assistant there as well that's going to help you as well. Uh, I think yeah. another thing to consider along those lines for organisations is right. AI has gone way beyond like the the techies, right? It's mainstream. Everybody's talking about the impact it will have. People are going to be using it and trying stuff. And if you don't give them a corporately sanctioned route they are for sure going out to the consumer models. Like, this is no doubt. Um, so, like, I mean, the $30 a user a month for the Microsoft 365 Copilot, it's an investment. It's a consideration. You have to think about the ROI there. The the If you've got ME365 or you've got um, Office 365, you can add the commercial data protection for $5 a user. I think that's a really good jump off point for a lot of people because that's you're giving a tool, you're you're getting to see if there's usage, you're getting some some accessibility to that. It's not as powerful as the full Microsoft 365 Copilot, but it's a it's a step along the journey there. So it doesn't have to be all or nothing. Um there's a kind of staircase there of getting some usage. And, and you can still do a lot with that tool. It's still really, you know, a good good starting point. Yeah. There's there's loads of useful content out there on the open web, so why not tap into that? So, you know, if if there's no if you're happy to say, look, you know, we understand there's some rich data in our M365 environment, then great, we'll look at Copilot for Microsoft 365. Um, you can have a blend of the two together. So I mentioned before about that overlap. So, say for example, in in your Copilot app in Teams, you can turn on a web content switch. So what it will also do as well is look at your M365 data, but also have a look what's out there on the open web. So it will reference where it grabbed the information from. So if there's like a really great SharePoint site, but also there's a really good website here as well. Um, a really good example, I, I, I ask Copart a lot what volunteering programs are available in the UK. So obviously in our various ERGs, we've got that information, but also Microsoft on the web or content on the web um, also tells me what what volunteering programs are available from other other resources as well. So the benefits of both are great, but you can use them separately, as Tom as Tom mentioned. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's fascinating, and I'm just going to ask the question about so what what are you seeing outside in the in the, in the world of the client? And I think you you probably both answered that quite uh, quite comprehensively. So. I think I'm going to move on to my, my next. So we had a question come in, and I'm not suggesting we have a sneak peek of the roadmap, Chris. So don't worry, I'm not going to put you on the spot for that one. <laughs> but when we when we were talking through this in the in the preparation, and you already alluded to it slightly as well, it's it's what the future looks like and the, the value for business. And you came up with this sort of four step sort of out of the box trained true AI, and then sort of the BYO integration type of pockets, and I, it. it I found that fascinating in terms of where you see the, the real value coming. So I don't know whether you can remember what you said to me, but if if you could elaborate a little bit more on where you see the future and the developments coming, that would be great. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, where, where we are at the moment is that as, as large language models and, you know, GPT um, originally was, was you know, d- not designed, but obviously when it was built to look at, you know, the the text, the analysis of language, and obviously learning about content um, that's out there in the public domain in terms of how it can help us create content. So obviously with ChatGPT, you say, can you write me a poem? It does it really well. So in terms of text, it, it works extremely well. And that obviously aligns to Microsoft because we work in the text, you know, with, with Word, PowerPoint, mm. um, and all that good stuff. And, you know, in terms of what it can do there is great. And then where we've kind of been working to improve that experience. So, um, Excel is a really good example. Excel is still in a bit of a preview state because it's more than text. We're talking about numbers, formulas, a lot of real scientific calculation going on in the background, especially with all the, <laughs> especially with all the Excel shortcuts you can you can fathom as well. So you know we are still working in those regards there as well. There's still a load of work that we're doing, say in PowerPoint, where we're working with you know making the designer experience a lot more rich. Um, and yeah, so those are sort of some key areas where like, you know, when we're looking at numbers and 
the visual side of things is actually really quite interesting. I, I think that's going to be another area that we're going to tap into. So we've seen just recently um, OpenAI launched. Um, so there was the GPT-4V where you're able to upload images into the LLM and then the LLM can generate a text output. So you can say, right, here's an image of a beach. I want you to describe that for me. And it and it works really well. So we're certainly seeing things in the imagery. Um, and like just recently, you may have seen that OpenAI also launched um, Soro, S-O-R-O, -O, that, that text to video. That's crazy. That's absolutely like absolutely phenomenal, just where you can put in a simple prompt and then it will make a very short video clip. Um, and like it, it's just, I, I think those sort of, um revolutionary cutting edge can also be used um you know say like in the microsoft 365 world um obviously depending on what you're doing as well um i certainly see audio being a good um place to develop as well so you know when we go back to team's phone and especially looking at the transcript um you know there, there's been loads of conversation around well how does it detect sarcasm and to be honest, it doesn't. So if I said, oh, this is a really good meeting, you can see that my facial expression and my tone of voice is, oh, yeah, he's he's really being sarcastic. But Copilot doesn't see that. It just sees a, a text that says, I feel really, this is a really good meeting. So I hmm. think there's going to be some really good stuff around audio as well. Like you already see in, you know, other contact center solutions where it does look at the sentiment. If you're if you're if you're angry on a call, I can sense the tone and I can score that. Say at this point, this call was quite um you know quite negative you want to take a look at this part of the of, of the call so i can see copilot doing some clever things there as well um so yeah, yeah just, we, just a little bit we, we have that in contact center today so it's definitely technically feasible isn't it it's uh yeah, it's, it's interesting to see where just, the where the line gets drawn. That, yeah so it's just the way that if copilot then sent that to the llm you've got a sizing problem because obviously audio um or even bigger than that video you're sending loads of meg off you know you're mm. sending lots of megabytes yeah. of data off to um you know off to the off to the services how do we basically streamline that and make sure that we don't get any bottlenecks um you know text is a little bit smaller so it's not too bad and also you know it goes up on a on a bit of a handshake so it sends certain you know when you use copilot you can see that uh, you know it brings back certain paragraphs only at certain points so it's there like churning through bits and bits at a time, but obviously with audio and video, it's a constant feed. You know, you're moving from, um, you know, TCP to UDP and it's like a little bit different. So there's some things around performance that would probably be needing to be looked at. So, yeah, I think audio and video would be really quite key to the um, to the future of, of, especially around generative AI as well. Fascinating. Um, Tom, I can see that you've been doing a fantastic job in trying to answer a lot of the questions as they've been coming through on the chat. Is, is there any that we've we've kind of missed that we we need to go back upon? No, I think I think we got most. And this has been a good chat about uh, the ROI and thirty dollars and that price point. And it's a fair conversation, right? Yeah, if you're yeah. like like you need to justify the ROI, your Microsoft have put that price because they think that's justifiable. But it's a conversation for each organization. Um, but I, I would just reiterate, it's not in my experience, it's not a license you're just going to blank it out, right? It's something that you have to see a use case for, you have to have a conversation about, and, and you have to train the users as well. Like this is a new technology and new capabilities. Yes, it's a text prompt, so people can sort of play with it and get some use out of it, but there's actually a fair bit to it in terms of leveraging the most out of it. Um, so it's, each org has to make a decision, but I, I just don't see, certainly in enterprise, I don't see anybody not having to have an answer to the the the, the you know CTO and up of yeah. do we want it or not have we tried it or not um, because it's just it's too impactful and the the other thing I would bear in mind is the crazy thing is this is the worst it's ever going to be like it's only getting kind of better and better and you see the jumps particularly if you watch the open AI news obviously Microsoft are very tied in with open AI you see the jumps in technology that's all going to flow through to us in, in the Microsoft 365 world in time. So um, it's, it's the beginning, but I don't think there's any any going back from, from where we are now. No, no, I agree. And I mean, we, we've, we've been exactly the same situation and, you know, the, the, the $30, it's kind of, you do need to look at the, the use cases, but we've actually found some with some of the, 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 the AI that we're using in house, um, it, it it does make a big difference to people's productivity and efficiency, and it's 
I haven't yet had anybody that's using it that's come back and said, well, no, take it away from me. I can't see the benefit. Um, you know, it's, it's really, it's made that difference. And I think it's a very, very valid point you make, Tom, in the fact that we're still in that infancy in this, in terms of co-pilot, not in terms of AI, in terms of co-pilot. Um, and I think it's, it's only going to get improved and get better from here. Yeah. Another interesting um, topic as well is that, you know, when it comes to the real value in, you know, justifying that that cost as well, um, a lot of customers really want to see those numbers, those hard, you know, those real truthful numbers. Um, sometimes when it comes to Microsoft, when it comes to return on investment, we tend to, you know, we, we generate some really good values of return on investment. Like, you know, you can save millions of dollars a year and stuff, but in terms of how that relates to the time saved and other sort of, um, you know, the more realistic numbers, as I call them, um, a lot of the time customers need support in those areas as well. So mm. um, a really good technique I tend to focus on when I'm talking about Copilot is that at the moment your users are already consuming Microsoft 365. So there are already some stats that you can tap into where you can break off between your real heavy I'm not going to say you're most productive, but they live in Microsoft 365. They are always, you know, they're in four to five meetings a day. They're, you know, they're saving three documents to SharePoint a day. They're sending out 50 emails a day. So those stats can already be collected. So in terms of trying to summarize or trying to justify that, if you then say, right, $30 a month, that relates to, say, like, I don't know, an hour and a half of someone's time um, in a month. Okay, so we're looking at saving an hour and a half of their time, or maybe more than that. Obviously, the more time saved, even better. So, with those stats that they're already consuming the M365 technologies, like if I send an email, that can be logged. There are some more, there are some tools already available that can help you get those numbers and then say, right, the average task of sending an email, Copilot can save you at least five minutes. If I then send 100 emails out in a month, that's 500 minutes instantly there's 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 your time saved and then you can say right yeah. that that's that's your value basically now obviously that's for real heavy hitting um users but you know in terms of like then say incentivizing someone to say well, actually you know because of my um say like i'm not i'm not really too um comfortable with all these meetings so i'm going to miss them or you know and then you can say right well using copilot you can still join those meetings but you can then use copilot afterwards or like say for example, they make one document a week, and with Copilot, they're now comfortable and confident, and they can make four or five. Um, so yeah, the, the, there's a really great tool called the M365 Usage Analytics that we've been promoting quite well. It's been it's been out for absolutely ages. It's a Power BI uh, report, um, and it taps into Microsoft Graph, and it then gives you those stats. So you can basically filter out from the last month or the whole year, and says right, we're going to agree that the ideal Copilot user needs to be in three meetings a day. So if you say there's 20 business days in a month, you times that three by 20. So we're looking at someone that's over, that's in over 60 meetings a month. And using this tool, you can also see that. And then using that 60, you can say, right, if we can save you 10 minutes per meeting out of those 60 meetings, you're then saving 600 minutes. There's your, there's your value. And you can then justify and build up really good business cases as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no it's, it's good insight. It's a great way of looking at it. And I think quantifying that is going to be important to many organizations um, because it's, I think so many times the efficiency and the productivity is seen as a kind of a soft benefit to some extent. Mm. Um, and then quantifying it is often uh, seen as being a bit vague. But I think it's, it's, it's a very valid point, as I say, in some of the, the examples that we've seen in, in house. Uh, at the time and saving and efficiency, um, we've actually, we, you, you can clearly see that people's output has increased. They're using the time that they're saving to do something else. Um, so, so I think it's very valid. I'm very conscious we're, we're getting close to the top of the hour. Um, I think there's been some great questions some great conversation going on here. Is, is there anything before we sign off, gents, that um, you'd like to leave or uh, something we've not addressed or any advice you want to give? Um, yeah, I think we've, it's been a really good conversation and thanks everybody. We had a great turnout. So thanks everybody for coming in the great chat. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it's too important a topic to not be educated and informed on. So like I, I absolutely hear the ROI and I think that is a really sensible approach to take with all technology, right? Technologists want to sell technology. Mm -hmm. It's a new thing, but like, um, but like 
that doesn't mean you shouldn't test it and check it out and, and see if it meets your bar uh, and and whatever the answer is at least you've got that information and now it's up from a seat i just think that's a a, a level where any you know, serious organization even a small one can can try it out uh, and you might be surprised about some of the capabilities so i think it's it's, it's exciting times for me anyway anything from yourself chris or are you oh putting, um, you, put, put, putting you on the spot it's getting late in the day. Um, oh, I've got to run out of things to say. Um, so I guess the other thing as well, I mean, there, there was a mention about, obviously, if you don't have transcription turned on or, you know, that's obviously where Copilot would 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 struggle because if you don't have transcript and more importantly, if you don't have data, then Copilot will just, you know, it will fall by the wayside. So definitely take a look at those policies about, OK, we, we accept that we do have to turn on transcription. But then, of course, you can back that up with things like retention policies. There's um, you know, just there's a setting now where you can just use Copilot during the meeting. So afterwards, um, there's basically like a temporary save transcript, and then after the meeting ends, it just disappears. So some really good safeguards in place as well. But I appreciate that there's other things that may counteract where Copilot will work. Um, a really good example is say like in Teams Premium, you can turn on end-to-end -end encryption. And obviously, if you've turned that on, then Copilot won't work as well because it's encrypted start to finish and Copilot can't retrieve that information. So definitely have a look at those policies where if you do turn off certain features, then that will impact that experience. So definitely review things like, you know, the transcription side of things, review your sensitivity labels, review your retention. Retention is a very important one because you don't want Copilot retrieving a 20 year old document saying this is this is factually correct. <laughs> Um, so yeah, just just really have considerations around your existing environment and where Copilot can can help you. I think that'll be my my last little um, swan song, uh, as as it were. Advice for like a nugget of advice. Thank you very much. Well, gentlemen, look, thank you very much for your time and and your insights there. I think it's been a really really good session. I think we've had one of the uh, attendees say it's gone really quick, and I appreciate everybody turning out and uh, spending that your afternoon or part of your afternoon with us. I appreciate how valuable time is. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, this will be available as a, an on-demand pre-recorded uh, session. So if you've already registered for the event, you'll get that link sent to you so you can uh, review it and go back and see what nuggets we've uh, we've, we've imparted to you uh, and keep it for 12 months and see where we are, and whether or not we've been right in what we predicted. So uh, brilliant. Tom, Chris, thank you very much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Um, and thank you for everybody's attention. Oh, look for. Yeah, thanks a lot. It's been fun. Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you, thank you guys. Cheers. Bye.